O God, giver of life and health, your Son, Jesus Christ, has called us to hunger and thirst to see right prevail. Refresh us with your grace, that we may not be weary in well-doing. For the sake of him who meets all of our needs, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
changed up the uh, the solo so we appreciate their flexibility and willingness um, in terms of announcements let me start off with an update on Jim uh, Jim is home uh, still recovering but is at home now and so uh, should be on the mend and of course that was nothing less than then I think a miraculous healing I'm going to go ahead and say that a miraculous healing for Jim uh, that is still continuing and so your prayers are still appreciated I um, want to thank um, Don Vick, who's filling in back on the back on the slides, uh, pushing the buttons back there, making the thing go forward, uh, and uh, appreciate his service. Um, so just a couple of announcements more. Um, today is the fifth Sunday of the month, and so we have our special offering for our scholarship fund, and your generosity is appreciated. We have a Jackson concert uh, tomorrow night at 7.30, tomorrow night at 7.30, uh, so you can join us for that. And then also want you to mark your calendars for August 28th, the last Sunday of August, which will be our fall kickoff. We'll have a, a single service here in the sanctuary at 10 o'clock. Uh, that will be followed by uh, some food and games and fun and all that kind of stuff over at the Family Life Center. Um, to kick off, to end summer and kick off fall, and we're very much looking forward to that. So uh, please have that on your calendar. And now, with joy and thanksgiving, let us offer to God the gifts that we have brought.
Almighty God, giver of every good and perfect gift, we give thanks to you for all the gifts that you have given to us. And in praise and thanksgiving, we offer you these gifts in return. Bless the givers and the gifts and those who have not to give. Use our gifts and us to do your work in the world, to spread your gospel throughout the earth, and to bring glory to your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. steadfast love endures forever. What a great being of the Lord's sake, who the Lord has redeemed from trouble, that the gathering from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some wandered in the desert wastes, finding no way to a city in which to dwell. Then in their trouble they cried to the Lord, who delivered them from all their distress. And led them by a straight way, till they reached the city in which they dwell. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind. For the Lord satisfies those who are thirsty, and fills the hungry with the things. The Lord 
turn the river, turn rivers into a desert, springs of water into thirsty ground. The Lord turns a desert into pools of water, a parched land into springs of water. They sow fields and plant vineyards and get a fruitful yield. trouble and sorrow. The Lord pours contempt upon princes and makes them wander in trackless wastes. But the Lord raises up the needy out of affliction and makes their families like flocks. The upright see it and are glad, and all wickedness stops its mouth. The Lord is wise, indeed, to these things, and sincerely the steadfast love of the Lord. If you can see it, you can see it says I-O-U. Little I-O-U. Now, first let me ask, what do you think we owe God? What do we owe God? Everything. Everything, right? I heard everything. Um, so let me let me let me try this one on for you. What we as human beings, each and every one of us individually and collectively, what we owe God is complete and perfect and constant. Love, worship, and obedience. Complete, perfect, and constant love, worship, and obedience. Now, is that a problem? Yes. Why is that a problem? Because we can't do it. And so we have this I of you. And, and every time, every time we sin, every time we do something wrong, that I of you gets longer and longer and longer, right? Uh, and you know our instinct then would be our instinct then would be is oh well We've got this huge I don't do this thing and, and so I need to start doing some good things And so we start doing some good things and the IOU gets a little bit shorter, but then what happens? We start doing bad things again and the IOU just gets longer and longer and longer We can't ever get caught up Right? We can't ever pay off this debt. It's a debt we cannot pay. And, and when many of us, some of us know either ourselves or know people what it's like to just be under a debt that we can't, we can't pay. So what we need then is for somebody to pay the debt for us. We need somebody uh, to pay off this debt. And of course, that's what Jesus does. Jesus comes along and he is able to give God on our behalf. He's able to give God that perfect and complete and constant love, worship, and obedience. And so he takes our eye of you, he pays it off, and he tears it up. Okay? But he doesn't just tear it up. Let me show you what else he does. This is not a cross, I didn't have time to make a cross, but the Bible says that he took our debt, he took that note, right? That handwriting that was against us, that says the King James Version, and he nailed it to the cross. And so that debt is gone, it's paid for, and it's destroyed. 
And that's what uh, Jesus did for us. Would you pray with me? Dear God, Dear God thank, you thank you for Jesus who paid our debt for us. Our debt for us. In his name we pray. In his name we pray. Amen. Stay where I put it. It's okay. I got another way to skin this cat. Our scripture this morning comes from the book of Colossians, chapter 2, verses 6 through 15. Listen to the word of God. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of the world, rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public, public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. The word of God for the people of God. <laughs> Let us pray. Dear God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, we are continuing our series in the book of Colossians called In Christ Alone. Uh, and our, our theme has been, to use big words, the supremacy and the sufficiency of Christ. That is, Christ is the best, supreme, and Christ is enough. He's sufficient. Sufficient in himself for our salvation. Uh, we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And the reason this becomes important, as we've said in the book of Colossians, is there have been some heresies that have emerged in the Colossian church, which basically we boil down to, although we're beginning to unpack them in detail, but we summarize them, we're saying um, these heresies were Christ and. Not Christ only, not Christ alone, but Christ and. Yet, yet Jesus is good, Jesus is fine, Jesus is just all right with me, but we, we have something else that we, we need to put alongside of Christ, uh, to really to really get it Paul of course is saying um, no no Christ alone uh, so uh, Christos in, in the Latin Christ alone and so last week 
we introduce the first of the heresies that were emerging in the Colossian church, that is Gnosticism. Uh, Gnosticism, you'll remember, was um, basically had two, two kinds of, of big important themes in it. First of all is the, the, the evilness, the, the, um, the, the, the body was bad, the body Physical existence is bad, that we are really spirits that have gotten trapped in the wrong body. We're all trapped in the wrong body, right? According to Gnosticism, we don't belong in bodies. Bodies are not good, um, and we need to escape our bodies. That's the point of religion, and we transcend the physical. Um, and, of course, then they also had the other feature is they had, they had some bizarre kind of of mysticism, some bizarre kind of supernaturalism going on, where they saw all these different ranks of angels and, and beings and you know spirits, and, and they were all into that, based a lot on Greek uh, philosophy. And of course, the problem is, where this became a real problem, is that Gnostics who wanted to adopt a Christian faith, or, or Christians who wanted to bring Gnosticism into their faith, had denied, they had denied, they did deny the, the physical body of Jesus, the incarnation of Jesus, because Jesus, bodies are bad, so if Jesus was good, then Jesus couldn't have had a body. Um, and of course, that's what we call heresy, it's false teaching, right? Um, if you don't believe that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, uh, James says, you're antichrist, right? Um, so, <clears throat> Excuse me. And then back to the second half of that point, I, I took along with the first half. Uh, so the first was Gnosticism. This week, we introduced the second, ritualism. Ritualism. Now, I, I am not saying, nor is the Bible saying, that ritual is bad. We need rituals. Um, because rituals kind of help grease the wheels to get us through our daily existence. Uh, because without rituals, even in our even in our day to day lives, without rituals, gosh, you'd have to think about everything you do, right? Could you imagine, you know, thinking about brushing your teeth every morning, thinking about, you know, uh, we 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 wouldn't get to the day without some things that were just ritualized that we can just do. In, in our spiritual life, we need rituals to bind us together, right? Because otherwise, if there wasn't some form of ritual. When we showed up here this morning, none of us would know what to do, right? There has to be some form of ritual to bind us together in, 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 in the church and, of course, to connect us to God. The problem with ritualism is when we start to depend on the rituals rather than on God. When it starts to become a big deal, oh, we've got to do this right, we've got to put this here, and this goes like this, and, and, and that, that disconnects us from God. And, and these were the twin problems than the Colossians were facing. And so I think if I had to sum up the problem the Colossians had, or if even Paul did, or I think even the Colossians themselves would say, that the Colossians were caught between the Jewish world from which the Christian faith came and the Greek world in which they lived. That the Colossians were caught, stuck, between the Jewish world from which their faith came and the, the Greek world in which they lived. And they were having a hard time. They were trying to synthesize some of that, synthesize, bring together. They were, they were trying to bring these two things together. They were trying to figure out how do we be Jewish, how do we be Greek. And, uh, and of course, that, the, the, neither of these is unique to Colossae in the New Testament. As a matter of fact, this whole idea of, of the Jewishness of Christianity had been a problem since the church launched. We go all the way back to the book of Acts. We can see this in Galatians. And so basically, the, the, the thinking that was spreading in, the, in, in many churches, and Paul combated this everywhere he went, was this idea that in order to be Christian, you had to be Jewish first. In order to be Christian, you had to be Jewish first. And, and the sign of being Jewish, the sign of being in the Jewish covenant, uh, was uh, circumcision. That's the sign of circumcision. We'll get that in a second. I just realized I skipped a point. And so stuck between these two worlds, it, it should come as uh, no surprise to us by now that the response to these tensions 
Paul points the Colossians and us back to Christ. Not, not Jewish ritual, not Greek philosophy, but Christ. That's what he's trying to say. Not Jewish ritual, not Greek philosophy, but Christ. This, 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 this is, the Colossians are trying to struggle with being in Christ in Colossae. That's their, that's their struggle. How do we be in Christ in Colossae? Or for us, how do we be in Christ in Lusitine? How much do we take from this old Jewish way of thinking? How much do we try to fit in with the Greek uh, way of thinking around us? And Paul says the answer is Christ. To be in Christ. And Paul says that since we have received Christ, let us live in him. And since we are rooted in Christ, let us grow in him. So, so start with Christ. You've received Christ, that's how you should live. You're rooted in Christ, that's how you should grow. As a matter of fact, I think one of the, one of the problems the Coloss Colossians are having is they, they realize that, that the Christian faith has disrupted their, their roots. They knew, they knew what it was to be Colossian. They knew what it was to live in the Greco-Roman world with its pagan worship. Those, those, in a sense, were their roots. And so the temptation is, is to over-identify with them or grab on to this old thing from which Christianity came out of and make that our roots. And I think they're like us. Because we live, I think, in an increasingly rootless society. And so I think, and we long for roots, we long for connectedness, which is why I think genealogy has become popular, right? We're, we're looking, where did we come from? To whom do we belong? What is our story? And, and what tribe do we fit in? Remember, I think it's this, this, this increase of the human sense of tribalism my group, your group, I belong here, this is my identity. I think that is what is tearing us apart because we're each trying to get back to our roots and that is dividing us. And so I, I took the thing when you spit the thing, you just put it in the mail and, and, and I found, found out that, that not, not unsurprisingly, um, that uh, a lot of Northern England, Yorkshire, Scotland, uh, uh, Fair amount of German. I knew that. I got I got German Mennonite roots from northern Indiana. Um, one percent African, interestingly enough. Uh, but 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 I want to tell you that I did I did that because I was curious. But I want to tell you that that my roots my roots are not in Scotland. My roots are in Christ. I'm going to say that again. My roots are not in Scotland. My roots are in Christ. I'm going to give you one more try. My roots are not in Scotland. My roots are in Christ. Amen. That's where we find our rootedness, and that's from which we grow. And so Paul is trying to say, don't look to the Jewish ritual. Don't look to the Greek philosophy. Look to Christ. Grow in Christ. So let us not, Paul says, take, let anyone take us captive through empty philosophy. He's going to dig at the Greeks again, at the Gnostics. He's going to take a couple more shots. Because he says, in Christ dwells the fullness of deity in bodily form. Remember, they didn't think Jesus had a body because bodies are bad. And in Christ we are brought into fullness. So you remember that... that um, the, what the, the other thing the Gnostics had going on was this idea of secret knowledge, and you can find secret knowledge, and if you stare at your belly button long enough, you know, suddenly you'll, you'll discover some, the secret to the meaning of life, and Paul says, no, 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 the secret to the meaning of life is not in your navel, uh, it's in the Bible, right? We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone is revealed in Scripture alone, that there are no secrets. Everything you need to know has been revealed to us in God's Word. But then 
Paul is going to shift his focus to this, to this Jewish ritualism that had emerged. That, that, that everybody needed to, that in order to be a Christian, one had to become a Jew. In order to become a Jew, at least for the fellas, um, there was some surgery required in the form of circumcision. Circumcision was the symbol of that old covenant, which by which God was saying two things. First of all, if you're going to be my people, you've got to cut yourself off from, from the world. You've got to be different. And if you are going to be my people and you're not going to live in obedience to the covenant, I'm going to cut you off. Um, and that was the symbol of the, of the old, old Testament covenant. Now, of course, our symbol of our, our New Testament covenant, our new life in Christ, is, is baptism. Is baptism. And so, um, in Christ, we have received spiritual circumcision, not physical circumcision. We have received spiritual circumcision, cut off from our old self, dead to sin, and buried in baptism. And, you know, I was going to say more about circumcision, but I think I'll cut that short. <laughs> um, so, uh, but baptism is our symbol because in, in baptism, what we are symbolizing is that we have died to our old self, we have been buried in the water of baptism, and then we have been resurrected to a new life in Christ. And so it symbolizes those same things, that idea of separating ourselves from the world, our old life, of dying to ourselves and to our sin and to our past, and receiving new life in Christ through baptism, symbolized by baptism. Baptism doesn't do it, God does it, baptism symbolizes it. And so in Christ, God, if you like, burned the mortgage of our life of sin by nailing it to the cross. Like I demonstrated in the children's sermon, Jesus obliterates, wipes out, that debt because he paid it for us. And so we have new life. Brothers and sisters, in Christ, we have, in Christ, God has made us alive again. He had to kill us first, but he has made us alive again. We are alive in Christ, in Christ alone. Let us pray. Dear God, we confess that in our rootless and wandering world, it, it is so easy for us to, to, to try to go back in time and try to grab on to some kind of historical tribal identity to, to feel like we belong. It's so, it's so tempting to try to go back into the past and grab something that, that, that seems so important at the time and, and, and elevate it. Um, on the other hand, for, for others of us at other times, it, it, it's so tempting to try to make this, this faith that we've been given somehow conform to, to our present world, to our, our 21st century North American kind of philosophy and way of being. And, and God, you say, no, no, I, I won't fit either of those. Um, you, you are not an antique or a curiosity, but God, you stand alone by yourself, unique, and so does our faith in Christ. And God, in Christ, you have promised us new life, but God, first we have to die. We have to die to ourselves. We have to die to our sin. We have to die to our own agendas and preferences. Um, and so, God, as strange as it might be, we pray today that you kill us. Kill us.
so that you can bring us back to life in you. So that we can have new life. So that we can be truly alive in Christ. God, we pray for this church. We pray that you'd bless us and help us to grow and prosper. Help us to worship and serve you in spirit and in truth and serve the world in your name. God, we pray for the whole body of Christ throughout the world. We pray for the persecuted church. We pray for the United Methodist Church, for this annual conference and our Bishop Lori and her complete recovery and our interim bishop death. We pray for this district and our superintendent done. We pray for our community, our nation, and our world in these troubled times. We pray for uh, men and women who serve us at home and abroad. We pray for our military, for our veterans, for our law enforcement, our first responders, for our missionaries and relief workers, for our healthcare workers, and all those that serve our community. God, we pray for uh, Jim and for all those that are in need in our church. God, we pray for our world leaders at every level. We pray for our government, our economy, and our environment. God, we pray for ourselves, our families, our church, our community, our nation, and the whole world with blessings of peace, justice, health, safety, freedom, stability, prosperity, and holiness. And now, oh God, we pray that you hear the prayers of each and every heart that is worshiping with us today, either in person or online, as, they, as we lift up our prayers to you, either silently or aloud, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Dear God, we know that you've heard our prayers here this morning. We know that you know our every need. And God, but we do not know how to pray your spirit intercedes for us with groanings that are too deep for words. And God, we pray that you hear us now as we lift our voices together in the prayer which our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. I invite you to stand and join me in professing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
one other quick announcement. Um, so Robert Morrison, who's back there on the very back pew, um, he is going to be leaving us for a period of time. He's going to be doing pulpit supply at Kelowna and Wellman. Yeah. Kelowna and Wellman. So he's going to be doing pulpit supply there while that pastor is on leave of the lay speaker. So uh, we want to bless him as he goes. Matter of fact, let me pray for him before the benediction. God, I want to thank you for, for Robert and for his, his willingness to um, serve and for the gifts that you've given him as he goes to uh, Kelowna and Wellman. And I want to bless that congregation and that pastor uh, there who's, who's leaving to care for, for, a, for a, a, a bad injury in her family. Uh, God, I pray for restoration for that family, for that church, and for, for Bob as he ministers among them. In Jesus' name. And receive this benediction. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord, and may the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit go with you now and remain with you always. Let us go into the world to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Experiencing grace, exploring truth, expressing love. Amen.